recycling and appropriation, and uh, what that means not only for the objects that are being copied, but also for the subjects that are copying them. Um, a little bit of background on Alessandra and uh, Clara. Alessandra Meroni is a career consultant and cultural policy expert working for public institutions, municipalities, and private enterprises with uh, MA career in cultural entrepreneurship for Baltics. And uh, Clara Marandashev is a writer and researcher working at the intersection of visual cultures and publishing and uh, is an alumni of the Free University of Berlin with a in media and visual anthropology. And uh, they both share background in the liberal arts in Milan. They are based in Berlin where they collaborate on different projects related to new technologies and social interactions and individual mindsets and the framework of labor and meaning in the creative sector. So uh, now I will uh, leave the floor to uh, Alexander Kahn. Thanks Eric for the introduction and thanks of course all of you for being here and for inviting us in the first place. So kind of sorry for those expecting much of the in Kino, but he's going to be here at some point so you have the Italian freaks instead. So um, we prepared something that we decided to call the performance lecture but we rather see that the moment of sharing questions and discussion on the topic of self-perception in social media when it comes to the production, distribution, and appropriation of content produced by other people. Um, just a few hints on how we intend to proceed. Basically, we'll have three parts, which are kind of built around something that for us is a meaningful image or a metaphor of the topic. And uh, we start from, let's say, more individual perspective on the framework then we, with a sort of ethnographical informed research uh, we ask a broader spectrum of people how they feel uh, about like, the topic and uh, at the end we will address more let's say theoretical concerns uh, in the field of media studies and social science so um, we started with the idea that our online activities mainly encompass the exploitation of online content and we actually um, noticed that the verb to steal went through um, a massive, let's say, shift of meaning with the advent of the internet. And why to steal before the internet meant to deprive someone of something, uh, steal after the internet, and especially in social media, means to copy without immediate consequences. And that's not, of course, like, let's say, the banal topic of piracy or plagiarism. But what we want to claim here is that what we do in our daily activities on social media is actually um, something that we really um, do without even acknowledging it. And um, maybe you can yeah. from this. In this sense, we could also say, or we'd like to claim that um, we live on the internet by stealing all the time. And um, just for you to know, um, not only we're friends, very close friends, but we also both work in the creative industries. And therefore, we spend a lot of time in front of a computer, facing a browser. And, uh, but then, in an eight-hour shift, we are not uh, always exclusively working, but we also like communicate with each other, read articles, conduct research for our site, site projects, and we use social media. And in this sense, um, Google Chats or Gchat offers us a sort of like window of freedom through which we can escape the labor task but still feel like uh, involved in a sort of like working environment. And since our off both offline and online relationship resolves for um, pretty much pretty much around like content we find on the internet, we decided to um, present you with a sort of like fictional Gchat conversation where we try to reenact or represent the creation or the building of a copy that self. And this is how it could work. Open browser, open Gmail, open Gchat. Good morning. Oops, I meant good morning. Have one day. Yeah, this is how I look now. Yeah, I've been there. Trying to make sense of these hours of no more ahead of me. I actually wonder if people work effectively all day or just hang out on the internet most of the time. By the way, have you tried one of these anti-social apps? It don't really work. Oh yeah, 
and procrastination. But you know, everybody uses like procrastination as a cue to get things done. We're all in the same boat. Procrastination can be a good tool, but an aggregate tool is not procrastinating. Well, Angelica Holson, uh, I take everything back. If I could actually use uh, laziness as a tool to achieve anything in my life, then I would be extremely powerful, very rich, and very productive. And I'm not any of these things. Yeah, these two things we have far more interesting desire than the average in this. I always want to be easy, be alone, be with you, cry, make you feel wanted. Someone else, be someone else, get by. Don't tell me about the topic of wanting because I haven't, I haven't figured it out yet. Um, really, have you? Yeah. Remember that we were vision theme song when we were kids. Not really. Yeah. I can't remember really. Yeah, it was like this fresh program, but something great was about to start. I don't know. This is how I would like my life. Or maybe that's just super lame, but happiness can be a good a translation of it. Happiness, love, pleasure, contentment, satisfaction, cheerfulness, merriment, variety, joy, joyfulness, triviality, jollity, being, delight, good spirits, lightness, well-being, enjoyment, exuberance, exhilaration, elation, ecstasy, jubilation, rapture, peace, peacefulness, euphoria, transport of delight, all the ending. Oh, yeah. I love something like that in my life. But you know, like, if you think about uh, procrastination and Hollywood endings, John Didion is very useful in this case. Check out what she wrote in, I think, 1968 or 69. Quote, that was the year, my 28, when I was discovering that not, not all of the promises would be kept, that some things are, in fact, irrevocable, and that it had counted, after all, every evasion and every procrastination, every word, all of it. I never forget that I have to go and get some work and get some concentration. By the way, I'm going to do staying in two weeks. Uh, what is it, like a HKB Effektion Concentration, like a workshop on a fiercely disputed asset of the Judaic Society concentration? Don't. Open window. Open tab. New tab. New tab. 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 Okay. That's pretty much um, like sort of building of our topic itself. I hope you got this somehow. Otherwise, maybe it was just like a ridiculous <laughs> moment, but I mean, cool. So, uh, coming to the second part of our intervention, we would like to suggest the image of the fund. Um, maybe some of you are German here, so you know what fund is. Anyway, like for people living in Germany, fund is quite um, like a common, let's say, tradition, can be translated in English as returnable button. And this is how it could work. Having technical difficulties. Oh no. Uh, I'll tell you why. Oops. Okay, let me know this is This is better than Las Vegas. You always win. I'm getting rich. Yeah. If you go to Las Vegas, this is what the slot machines will be like. You're sitting there. Okay, there. Okay, yeah. Okay, I think you got what it's about. So behind the funds lies the idea that returning a new object, or better, introducing this object into a chain of production and consumption, um, deserve a certain reward, let's say. I get money back, I get a refund. And I get money even if the object wasn't actually mine in the first place. So imagine you, you find a button on the street, you can return this object and get money. So basically, the general feeling is that you are constantly involved in a process of enrichment and yeah, <coughs> ever improving process of enrichment. 
um, before social media, the idea of using content produced by others was associated to theft or plagiarism, as we claim in the first part of our intervention. Now, instead, we mainly navigate the internet by online content, which is not always of our own production. Yet, this process of discovery, appropriation, and distribution on this content um, translates sometimes in a freeing sensation of belonging and, yeah, it's a good sense in a way. Of course, the more content is rare, unaccessible, and let's say non-mainstream, non -mainstream, the more we feel like we're the ones actually entitled to share it, and so to appropriate the content as ours. Um, my virtual self is this, this, this way enriched, and this somehow has an effect also on the perception of my offline self. So imagine you are in, like, in a social event, and you happen to mention that picture you found on Instagram, um, you kind of like find this image more meaningful than your own state of mind, so this becomes somehow yours. And in order to, let's say, broader a bit the spectrum of people approaching the same problem that we face in the first place, we organize a survey to investigate the same question. So how, like, sort of the, the idea of stealing content is perceived by people in their daily social media activities. So um, our survey touched uh, around 100 people from our social entourage, so family, friends, and social like acquaintances, and with a very small percentage of people under 25, I think, and over 40 years old, um, the major demographic reflected somehow our working environment. So people between 25 and 40 years old, active in the creative field, <laughs> or in the academia, and uh, yeah. Um, with a good portion of them um, working as a freelancer. And actually, they do make frequent use of social media, regardless of the type of social media. So we, we chose to keep this kind of open. Um, so they claim they mainly share between one, like once a day and more than three times a week, something like this. This is one of the first questions we ask, okay, which uh, is the content you mainly share? We created three categories, so self-produced, produced by others, or produced by others, shared by friends and or followers entourage. More than a half of the people, so 51%, claim that they actually tend to share content produced by others. The other data, so the 36% of self-produced content, we believe is kind of uh, significant in the, like, with the thing we said before, so like, yeah, so freelancer, creative field, but in any case, the 51% said, okay, content share produced by others. Coming to a more quantitative um, aspect, so we, we said, okay, how much of this shared content uh, has been fully exploited, has been fully made use of? And very interestingly, just, um, sorry, no, not just, like more than half of the people said, yeah, mm, about a half, so 56% of the people, which in a way is kind of interesting because it means that if I share an article from New York Times, Guardian, or whatever kind of thing, maybe I feel that just like maybe the title or the subtitle is enough to propose this as something I wanna like, yeah, sell or I don't, yeah, show off in a way. And, um, and I don't even know what's in there. So um, then just like to give you a bit of uh, idea, I think you can recognize yourself in this um, pool of choice of people like, posting stuff. So what was the last content you shared on social media? We got different replies. Um, so a photo of a group show a friend of mine did in Paris. Photos of tomatoes I picked in Florence. Uh, best regions to travel to from Lonely Planet, videos from like 80s West uh, subculture in Berlin, Louis C.K. Uh, opening monologue at Saturday Night Live, uh, Rhubarb Pie, and um, Facebook post about the NASA mission, uh, Dome mission. Dome mission, yeah, moon stuff. So, okay, maybe you can. Yeah, so we, of course, we also asked a very popular question. Are you, do you feel like defined or do you feel represented by your virtual profile, your virtual self? And uh, the majority um, acknowledge their virtual self as something that could like actually 
uh, identify with. And then we had like a remaining 60% dividing between not feeling represented at all by their online uh, identities or not having an opinion on the subject. But nevertheless, and this is the, the data, uh, the last slide majority um, claimed that the social media um, are, is, a, is a tool through which they can enhance and improve their, their knowledge or awareness and so, and so on. And um, this is particularly, like, this data is particularly interesting because um, in a certain sense, it contradicts the previous one. So it shows somehow that there's a discrepancy between the functionality we assign to uh, social media and then the impact they have on our self-perception. So finally, to um, make sense of the, of the data we collected, we came up with four different characters uh, which um, uh, interviewees could pick to define their um, behavior or, or their, to describe their, you know, their uh, virtual stuff, so to say. And the explorer was the first one and the one who collected the, the majority of um, preferences with 60%. Then we had the creator with 21%. Then the discover with 15, and finally the oh sorry the emulator with um, four percent. So um, in this scenario, uh, we we want to stress the fact that um, the emulator, so only four people out of um, 100 um, declare that they 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 saw themselves as as, as emulators. But then um, we we tried to invent we invented this category in order to um, to stress somehow the copycat feature, feature of our um, online activities and operations. And in this sense, to press control V, control C is a very frequent action. It's something we do uh, basically all the time on the internet. Yet we are not, um, we are not so, like we don't have this, this operation uh, as embedded as much as we practice it. Sorry, this was a long sentence. Uh, but then conversely, the most um, chosen category is the one of the explorer. And if we, if we think about the figure of the, of the explorer, well here you can see like a penguin, but <laughs> imagine something a bit braver. Um, it's like we always think about somebody who's like, who has like a very adventurous attitude, who's like ready to travel um, along the Amazon River or on the top of the Himalaya. And now it seems that it seems like we, like this, this characteristic, this figure has translated just in a very flat, generalized feeling. Because like, if we would like, uh, I choose to be an explorer when I did this survey myself. So, um, so, so then, um, if we if we would see really ourselves as explorers, uh, the question is also. Where are we directed? Like, which is this online territory we approach every day when we face social media? Um, and most importantly, which is our quest? And maybe you can, yeah. Okay, coming to the third part of our intervention, um, I'm just going back for a second to the survey where we actually see that the majority of interviewees acknowledge social media as a tool to enhance their knowledge and level of general consciousness. However, over 50% declare that they consume only about a half of the content they share. So we can reasonably ask ourselves, are they perhaps faking content consumption? And what about the other we engage in a conversation with, which is always like, let's say, our referee in social media? <coughs> and furthermore, how do we deal today with the notion of authority? So we are trying to make sense of this Imagine like the evolution of a social self, and we would like to suggest like the final and third parallelism that we sort of um, yeah we found kind of very emblematic because um, we see like yeah a sound analogy between the behavior of the self like the contemporary self in social media and the classic mode of cultural production in the ancient regime. Up until the 16th century, circa. The concept of originality um, was quite the opposite of today. So um, the value of originality laid almost entirely um, in the ability of the artist or author of Craftman to sort of emulate pre-existing content and deeply embed every new structure into like the classical and canonical form of transmitted throughout the century, so the tradition. 
um, such mode of production was a sort of like follow the sort of tripartite movement. So there was the imitation that we can somehow um, see as a copy or a translation, if you want. Then we had the emulation, um, which um, entailed a sort of like more um, sophisticated process where the author was trying to overcome like the tradition, but still keeping the, exactly the same framework. And then at the end, the assimilation where the subject became sort of like the object because um, like the value of the tradition was, was so embedded in him or her, but unfortunately him always. And uh, so it became a sort of like object um, this emblematic process also, of course, reflected the socio-political structure of such times, uh, where the adherence to a norm and pre-established uh, status quo, so authority, if you want, um, was the basic foundation of any political and social and religious entity. Um, to our sense, it is perhaps a funny paradox that we sort of like replicate this thing today, but like the main difference we can see, even like in a sort of immediate sense, is that if we think maybe, okay, an emblematic figure like of the ancien regime in medieval times especially, um, is a monk, so copying like uh, a code from the Bible in the monastery all by himself and with a tradition like here, on top of his head, and mostly alone, so even if like inserted in a community, like the work was just like individual. What we can see today conversely in social media is that the self uh, is really much social in the sense that there's no self without, there's no social self without other. So like putting maybe Facebook, we are always connected. And this of course um, affects somehow um, the like, sus like nature of the self itself. So, like, this is our statement for now. Then we see how to elaborate and expand a bit of this. But in imitating, emulating, and assimilating online content, the self is not alone. Yes, uh, but one could argue, of course, we are on social media, so this is pretty obvious that the self is not alone. We are always connected, and that we are basically engaging in a sort of like overwhelming conversation with the other. But um, we want to make a deeper point here, which is that the author is a very ambivalent figure, which um, represents on the one hand a fellow, and then on the other hand an authority. Uh, so in this direction, the self plays a twofold game. Um, firstly, we want to engage towards the other just as a member of the social entourage, so like a passerby, someone just like us. And in this sense, Gert Loving, uh, when he was addressing the difficulties of philosophy and social sciences to understand concepts such as the self or the social in the era of internet media, writes that, quote, <laughs> the social is precisely what it pretends to be, a calculated opportunity in times of distributed communication. In the end, the social turns out to be a graph, a more or less random collection of contexts on your screen that blabber on and on, until you intervene and put your own statement up there. Thanks to Facebook simplicity, the Orient experience is a deeply human experience. Uh, the aim is to find the other, not information. So, and then secondly, um, so <coughs> first the, the other as, as fellow, as, as peer. And then secondly, uh, we believe that we address the other uh, as authority. So as quote, as already produced content, which reinforces our individual experience in the eyes of the uh, social entourage. And um, Horning writes about the constant longing for external assessment and argues that that ranking, so likes, um, followers, and so on, that ranking becomes the means to assure perpetual insecurity in the midst of a notion of affirmations prompted by the platforms that harbor the digital selves. So this, however, this, however, shouldn't be seen as a like mere narcissistic operation, so navel gazing um, kind of thing, but um, but rather um, should be seen as a quest for authority. If I consider like a YouTube video or an Instagram picture more meaningful to define, like more uh, capable to define a personal feeling than my my own words, then um, somebody could argue that my virtual persona is completely subjective to that. But other content, that content found on the internet, which was produced by others. 
Um, in this sense, we are totally free to copy like um, internet objects in our online stream. Yet, in our daily referencing, we are always like striving and somehow directed towards this external authority. So we think we seek the authority of other content to represent our experience on social media, perhaps because we are led by the illusion that. Uh, such a creation would make our experience more understandable, shareable, which is popular, you name it. But um, we want to, to stress the fact that here, before likability, we believe that the self is actually looking for human comprehension. So finally, as we observe the, uh, the self-striving, like oriented towards this like fellow companion, fellow peer, and this other first, which is like the authority, uh, we, we would like to, to argue that this, dialect, this dialectic happens because um, the self not only is never alone, but is also not just one thing. Rather, it is an entity constantly striving to give a voice to a very multifaceted nature. And its main concern appears to express a very complex identity, which appears to be constricted by a single platform, by a unique just one, one account. And in this regard, the warning states that um, social media offer a single profile for our singular identity, but our consciousness comprises multiple forms of identity simultaneously. The problem is not that the online self is inauthentic and the offline self is real. It's that the self derived from the data processing of our digital traces doesn't correspond with our active efforts to shape an offline online hybrid identity for our social, uh, genuine social ties. So for instance, a Facebook or a Twitter are um, platforms designed with the same layout, the same like, kind of like creepy blue um, for everybody. Like everybody has uh, just one, one platform, one layout. And in this self, in this sense, we could say that the self seems to be constricted like um, his or hers individual expression is, is limited in a sense. And so the self, in our opinion, um, is thus forced to combine a media-based under configuration with a personal interpretation of such media, of such configuration. So um, in such landscape, as we, as we see the self uh, having this like double behavior, so on the one hand very self-oriented and then on the other hand uh, always like looking for the words of the other, of, of, for, for authority, we uh, would like to ask you today, uh, what's the place of originality of, in order to free itself from the constrictions of social media, the self acts as a copycat? Yeah, furthermore, we can even say, um, okay, this is super, like, a strong statement, uh, I know, but are we actually assisting to the rise of a new perception of originality, at least in the virtual realm, so to say? And it's kind of like interesting for us also to see how you perceive this emulation or explorer kind of feeling. So would you actually claim that, yeah, I copy stuff, I don't have a problem with that. Or we are kind of like getting back to the, let's say, analog mode of copycat. So if I copy the shoes that my friend has, it's actually like, yeah, it's not so good because it means that I don't have a strong personality. But like, is this the same in social media? Because we notice it's not, apparently. We do it and we don't find the thing like, kind of disturbing. Yeah, it's not possible. So, yeah. Our turn, if you want, otherwise, <laughs> it's okay. <laughs>